Good morning. Today I'm in the hospital. Um, I'm in a family room, so I may have to quit at some point if most people can. But it's 4.30 in the morning, so I don't expect too many people in and out of here. But my son has had a uh, catastrophic uh, liver failure. My 10-year-old, the one with the, does the uh, special effects. Weird thing, kind of sort of rare, but uh, it happens. And 50% of the time, they never figure out why. Well, that's kind of where we're at right now. So, I'm here to help people and so, um, and educate people. So, let me try to do that with this situation since it came up in my life. So, he was uh, presenting with a rash and a low grade fever, which is not uncommon. He's got a lot of allergies, so, uh, and he likes to play in the farm and in the, in the woods and in the hay fields and with the animals. So he occasionally gets a rash and a low grade fever from his allergies. And, you know, went to bed. Next morning, got up, got 102 fever. And throughout the day, it creeped up to 103. And we started giving him ibuprofen. Brought the fever back down, but he still wasn't feeling too good. The rash kind of came and went which is not uncommon when he's got an allergy going on or a virus. Um, that was Thursday and Friday. Saturday, same deal, but he started throwing up. Couldn't keep any food down. We were having trouble. We were pushing liquids, but he, he was not cooperating. He, he just didn't feel good. He didn't feel like drinking, and we kept pushing, but he wasn't drinking. Wasn't eating. And Saturday night he was pretty tired and lethargic. Sunday he was even more so. But he did eat something, but he th I think he threw it up, if I remember right. And then, uh, you know, we were starting to get kind of worried a little bit. Um, almost took him to the hospital, but decided to wait one more night to see what would happen. Uh, he, he refused to take ibuprofen at because we gave him some child and children's ibuprofen. It's like the third or fourth dose, you know, trying to keep his fever down, which he was doing pretty good. It was hovering around 100, 101. Um, but uh, he it, he threw up the ibuprofen one, it, immediately after he took it within 60 seconds, and he refused to take any more. So I talked to him, and he likes to take a bath. So I told him to take a bath, which is good for getting the fever down. I got the fever down, and he went to bed. I slept up in the room with him that night just to kind of monitor him, and uh, but I was tired, so I slept pretty hard. Next morning, the wife comes in at 6.30ish before the sun comes up and checks on him, and he's starting to get kind of cyanotic. His fingernails and his toenails are kind of purplish blue. Not bad, but they're it's obviously getting cyanotic. And his skin had a slight yellow tint to it. And she was kind of, she was worried about it. So she woke me up. And so I started giving him a check over and I checking his pulse and his breathing was definitely, his breathing was definitely rapid and erratic. He wasn't having a hard time breathing, but he was, he didn't have any sinus stuff going on or anything. It was a stomach bug, but he was definitely in distress. And I was having a hard time getting a wrist pulse, which is not uncommon if you're dehydrated. Um, I didn't want to panic my wife or him because she gets wound up and um, so I didn't go for the carotid or you know start trying to take blood pressure or anything like because that would be out of the norm I didn't want to do anything abnormal so but I did suggest that we needed to take him in just to get him checked because I was having a hard time I got an oximeter at home I couldn't get his oxygen reading or anything so part of it's because it's an adult oximeter and he's a child I explained that and I said with his color being off and everything, he was really lethargic, we should go to the hospital. So we went to the hospital. It was a local, small town, country hospital. It's not, it's not a big, it's more like a clinic. Well, of course he was dehydrated, which I knew. And uh, they couldn't get a vein. They tried multiple times in different places and they couldn't get a vein to get an IV in to hydrate him. They could get his... Uh, his vitals because they got machines for pediatrics 
and they weren't too bad. They were, he was obviously in distress, but that's not abnormal when you're sick. But the not being able to get a vein thing was pretty serious. And the color thing was pretty serious. We could, we, we knew that. Uh, doctor thought it might be the gallbladder. Thought he might have a bile, a bile duct, uh, bile duct block to account for his coloring, but he wasn't sure. And obviously it was something to do with his liver. So we decided, or he suggested that we go to a, a near, nearby larger city hospital, which we did. But the problem was that everybody's full because everybody's sick. Nobody's taking transfers, so he couldn't go by ambulance. Um, I was a little bit concerned because um, I had to carry him to the car. He's 100 pounds, which is not a, I mean, I'm, I'm getting old, but I can still carry 100 pounds. I used to do that as a firefighter for a long time, so I've, I've always done that sort of thing. But still, carrying a 100 pound kid around to the hospital is abnormal, and I was concerned. But again, I had to act like nothing was wrong or, or seriously wrong. So I just put him in the car and I, he asked me on the way to the hospital. My wife was with me, so it's a little extra tense with the wife because she's very easily stressed. And he's like, Dad, I'm, am I going to die? And I'm trying to be flippant and make things uh, as peaceful as possible. I said, well, son, we're all going to die. But I don't think you're going to die today. You just really sick you're not feeling well and you're dehydrated because we couldn't get enough fluids in you and you really need an IV to get your fluids back up you start to turn yellow because uh, you might might be because you got dehydrated and and that may have caused a blockage in your gallbladder uh, which might clear up if we get you hydrated it might not if it doesn't they, they've got medicine and the capabilities of fixing that so I don't think you're gonna die today and so we got to the hospital, and that took a while because they really were packed. And um, yeah, the doctor, ER doctor, came back pretty quick and, uh, and let us know that it was serious. It was his liver enzymes were off the charts. Um, like his liver was shutting down, and they didn't have the capabilities of doing transplants. So they sent us to Chicago, which is where I am right now, and. His situation advanced abnormally fast, and so within 24 to 48 hours, his liver was 90, 95% dead. It just wasn't working. And they had to use machines to keep him alive. They were going to life flight him, but um, they couldn't. So, and it wasn't because of. Uh, it was because of the way the situation was. They couldn't do it. The weather was one of, one of the factors. The other is the helicopter. Uh, this hospital has a really high helipad, and it was too high for the capabilities of that helicopter to do it safely in the weather conditions that they had. So couldn't do that. We had to drive. So I followed the ambulance. My wife rode in the ambulance. She didn't drive too well at night. And we drove the three hours to get to Chicago. Uh, on the way to Chicago, he started getting delirious because all the uh, toxic chemicals that the liver was not producing and was producing because it was dying were starting to affect the brain, cause swelling, and it was making him confused and combative. So they had to hold him down on the gurney. It was uh, very uncomfortable and disturbing for my wife. I'm sure it was uncomfortable for the EMT. I used to do that sort of thing. So uh, they got him into the hospital. They sedated him, and they started. They hooked up all the machines, and they did um, dialysis, among other things. And plasma flush is trying to get all those toxins out of his body. At the same time, they're trying to balance all his electrolytes and all his chemistry and his blood and. Basically, the liver has to do with everything in your body. They had to artificially maintain his sugar and his nutrients and his insulin. and It was very touch and go for up until now. And it still is to some degree. But he is, thank God, getting better. It's a miracle. So we've had all kinds of support. And I God bless everybody who's prayed and helped us out. Good morning. Um, we're very blessed.
it's worked out that way. So uh, he's recovering right now. Uh, they still have him somewhat sedated. Sorry about the noise. Uh, he uh, he's in and out of consciousness. Uh, he's in a lot of pain. They had to cut him from from rib to rib, and then down to the from the top of his uh, or from the bottom of his sternum down to the top of that incision. So he's got a big big cut across his belly. Um, God bless the donor and the family that lost their loved one. Uh, it's a horrible thing. Uh, it, it was a drug overdose, and uh, yeah, that's a hard thing. Uh, I, that actually, what's really touching in that respect is that that same thing happened to my nephew. My nephew, I've got time, I think. My nephew was, from the time he was little, he had scoliosis pretty bad. And I don't know if you know this, but you're Cerebral spinal fluid pumps like your heart does. The cerebral spinal fluid pumps from the sacrum up to the the brain through your spinal cord. Are your vertebrae? <coughs> it's a slower pump. It's not as intense as a heart. But if that pump it controls the pressure and the flow of the cerebral spinal fluid through your nervous system and your brain and your to your sacrum, your spinal cord. If it gets out of whack, it, the pressure gets too high or low, it can affect your inner ear, which affects your balance, it causes vertigo if it gets out of whack. Well, when you've got scoliosis, you're putting, you've got the zigzag pressure on your spinal cord, and it can, if it's severe, it can inhibit that pump. Well, that's what was happening to my nephew. And I was going through massage school at that time, learning about all this stuff and how to fix it from a natural therapeutics perspective. Um, and I tried to help him, and it did help a little bit, but it wasn't enough. And so over the years, as he got older, uh, it was decided, not by me, but by his family and, and the doctors, that he might benefit from surgery. So they put two rods down the sides of his vertebrae to hold them straight. Unfortunately, that didn't do much, but cause him a lot more pain. <clears throat> and so he got, this is when Oxycontin was big, and he got hooked on that. And then when it got bit to be a big controversy and they were taking it away from people, they took it away from him. And they didn't really give him a good alternative. And so he turned to street drugs. And so he was on heroin. And it wasn't so much out of wanting to get high and escape the world, he was in pain. So unfortunately, he didn't know that he had a congenital heart condition, neither did the doctors. So from the time he was born, he had a heart condition, which amplified the dangers of the street drug and that's exactly what happened eventually he unintentionally overdosed and they found him in his bedroom so I don't know the situation of the donor who donated their kidney or their uh, liver to my son but I completely um, give the benefit of the doubt and whatever the reason was uh, may God have mercy on them and I'm truly sincerely sympathetic to their loss God bless them. God bless their child. Um, George is a wonderful child, and he, and this whole experience has been like a Christmas miracle. I know that sounds crazy, but it's been a lot of healings happen from this, uh, even though it's been very difficult. Uh, it's brought the family closer together, and more importantly. <clears throat> Well, not more importantly, but just as importantly, it's brought my view of the world to be less pessimistic. Uh, I belong to an Orthodox church, and uh, I live in a country community uh, in central Illinois, and everybody, people I don't even know, they, they started a GoFundMe to help us out because we're going to be out of work for at least a month. He's going to be in ICU for a couple weeks trying to get stable and then they're going to put us in a hospital room probably for a week or two just to make sure and then we're going to get sent home and he's going to be like the boy in the bubble uh, because he's going to be on immunosuppressants and that's hard when you live on a farm or in the country and you're not used to you know having a sterile environment so he's going to have to stay at relatives house in town that's got cleaner 
home facilities because we've got too many animals to keep things that clean. I mean, we, we have a clean house. I don't mean we don't live like bears or whatever, but it's going to be cleaner staying at Granny's in town. Um, yeah, it totally disrupts your life, and uh, but it's all been a blessing because it's brought people together. And, of course, the Orthodox Christian Church is international and has been for 2,000 years, give or take a few hundred years. So, you know, our church is on every continent, and we have gotten all kinds of support from all over the world, literally. So glory to God for that. Cross myself on that one. Uh, the prayers are still needed. I mean, he could reject the liver, although it's been a miracle this whole time as far as his recovery goes. He's, the, the surgery went as perfect as it could, and his recovery is going well. So I pray that continues. And then, uh, yeah, we'll try to get through the next year. A couple of insights I've learned from this, uh, besides all the connectivity of the family and the, and the church, it's just the liver alone, all the things it does to keep us alive, is incredible. That's not by chance. And to consider that God created that and the whole universe and everything in it, and he maintains the life for all of us individually and countless people, not just now in the present but throughout history, is just mind-blowing. And not just people, but all the creatures in existence on the planet and the balance of everything. Truly incredible. Glory to God. That's a lot of love he's showing us. We should be appreciative. We take it for granted. The other thing I thought about was, um, you know, the scriptures tell us repeatedly to pray all the time. And um, that's not easy to do. But this situation has taught me how to do it to some degree. I mean, I haven't done it yet, but I'm working on it. And the reason I'm working on it is because I have to, like a bit and bridle, unfortunately, because I'm concerned for my son's life, and uh, it is moment by moment. It has been all week. Um, that's a very humbling and enlightening thing to think about and I I hope other people think about that life is a gift every day and we we've heard that before everybody knows that but you don't really really know that until you you know that I mean you know know it from experience so I've known I've worked in hospice for years and worked in the medical field I mean since I was a child I've been around people who are old and dying and same thing when I was an EMT uh, firefighter rescue firefighter and all that you see a lot of this stuff. It's different when it's your job and you clock out and go home. I mean, it's not that I didn't think about things that I'd seen or experienced or patients and years later still thinking about them and what they went through. I, I do. But, uh, yeah, it drives the point home even more, more when it's people in your immediate family. So I hope that uh, that helps people. Now, on a practical level, how you do that it's really with your heart you know saying the Jesus prayer there's, there's a book called The Way of the Pilgrim I highly recommend it's, it makes it very simple to understand but you just say Lord Jesus Christ have mercy with every heartbeat uh, you, you focus on your heartbeat and when you when your heart's beating you know Jesus said it, the kingdom of heaven is within you well every beat of your heart is given to you by God so God is actually dwelling in you. Uh, everywhere present fills all things. So if you're praying with your heartbeat, asking Jesus for mercy, you draw your. You couldn't have a more direct connection, conversation with God, and feel His presence when you pay attention to Him that way. And you will feel a sense of peace and and love and a lot of other blessings uh, come over you. The challenge is to maintain that, not to lose it, no matter what happens. And I'm nowhere near that. I'm struggling to do that. But that's 
that's where we're that's where what we're supposed to be working towards because that's what we want for eternity to be with Christ to have that relationship so to, to be with God who grants us life and if we're with him it won't just be in this life it'll be eternal but if we're not with him and we're totally focused on this corruptible life that ends that will be our eternity so Lord Jesus Christ have mercy on us that's a heavy heavy duty statement but it's very true from my experience so, alright I try to keep it no more than 20 minutes and I'm there um, I just wanted to share this um, my son's going to be on the on medication the rest of his life um, unless a miracle happens right? but who am I to expect miracles right so um, maybe I'm, this is not a good attitude to have maybe I shouldn't have that attitude God gives blessings and miracles to people all the time and who knows maybe, maybe he won't have that but I have faith that he couldn't but um, I don't want to be presumptuous if that's, that's what I was trying to say so I know God can do that I just don't want to be presumptuous and I certainly don't deserve it so alright well I'm in danger of rambling on senselessly so pray for me a sinner pray for my son George and my wife for sure and all of our family and, and, and the whole country and the world uh, it was a nice to have some renewed hope in the world seeing all the love and the support we've gotten from people all over the world literally they were having all night vigils and stuff so God bless them uh, pray for me a sinner thank you over and out